This morning we're going to be in John chapter 9. We're going to be picking up a story we began there last week. John chapter 9 on page 758. If you want to go ahead and open your Bible there so you can follow along with us. It's a, a great story that uh, reveals a whole lot about, about being blind. And so that's where we're going to be. John chapter 9 will begin in verse 6, uh, page 758. Most of you have heard me talk before about when I was a kid growing up, you know, we didn't have TV. We spent a lot of our time, our greatest form of entertainment was sitting around telling stories. And you think about it, that has been one of the main forms of entertainment probably since man uttered his first word. And maybe it's kind of a, a guy thing. I know uh, when Blake and I have gone on fishing trips, we'll sit around the campfire telling stories all night long. And when I go to the rendezvous with my brother, we'll sit around and tell a story. You get two guys together, and before long, they're going to be telling stories about different things. And it's not always telling a story to preserve accurate history, but they're kind of just for entertainment stuff. You know, like I said, when I get together with my brothers, we all sit around and tell stories, and it drives Dory absolutely crazy because she's heard the same stories over and over and over again. And it's kind of like, you know, how many of you have ever read the same book twice because you liked it? Okay, or watched the same movie twice because you liked it? Well, see, we tell the same stories again because we like them. They're good stories. They're entertaining stories. And it's not that you sit down and, and well, first of all, you have to understand the art of telling a story is realizing that the story is for entertainment, Okay. It's not necessarily for the passing on of history. And so you don't get bogged down in every little detail of the story. You're, you build the story so that at the end you've enjoyed the story. One day, this is several years ago, we were in our kitchen, family get together, and we're sitting there all sitting around, and well, I started telling a story to someone who I won't name my sister-in-law, but as I'm telling the story, she keeps interrupting, going, well, why would he do that? And then you're kind of like, well, I don't know why I do that. Pam, just let me just go on with this. Oh, I said I wasn't going to say her name. Anyway, so you go on and then a little bit, she says, well, now that doesn't make any sense. If so-and-so did this, why did he do that? Just... Bear with me here. So you go on with the story, and finally, after a, quite a bit of time and multiple interruptions, I just I finally said, Pam, it's just a story, Pam. If you'll let me get finished with it, you might actually even enjoy it. You know, it's just a story. But there are some people that get so focused on the facts that they miss the most the awesome picture of other stuff that's going on around them. In John chapter 9, there's this story of this young man. Young man, we don't know for sure how old he was. We know he was at least 13 because his parents say that he's of age. But there's this awesome thing that happens. He's healed from being blind from birth. But there are so many of the people around him that just didn't see it because they were too busy focused on other facts. And, and so they missed what was really going on. Some people get so caught up in the details, they miss the awesome stories around them. And that's where we get this expression, you know, can't see the forest for the trees. You've all heard that. You get so focused on the individual trees in front of you that you can't see the forest. And that's the way some people are. So last week, we began this series on abundant living, talking about uh, blindness. And we talked about blindness being in the, sen in the sense of knowing that there are things that we don't see. And we, we kind of looked at this man who was born blind, who, who Jesus opened his eyes. And we kind of talked about the fact that we in, in some ways are born blind. There are things that we don't get in life. We, we're kind of talking about this in our study through Ecclesiastes on Sunday mornings, but but this is a good kind of blindness. It's a good kind of blindness when we realize I don't understand everything, I don't have a grasp of everything, and therefore, God, I need you to open my eyes, to show me the things that you need me to see so that I can know your Son and trust your Son because I am blind without Him. That is a great kind of blindness. 
And that's the kind of blindness that was illustrated in the man born blind last week. And we talked about the fact that we need to, to acknowledge that kind of blindness so we can learn to fully rely on Christ. Well, this week we're going to look at a different kind of blindness that is a whole lot worse. Where that was a good kind of blindness, there's also a kind of blindness that is not good. And that's a kind of blindness that is self-imposed. And it's a blindness that is caused by the fact that we think we already get and see everything. And because we think we already see everything, there's no reason for us to ask for our eyes to be open. After all, we see. So we don't need to recognize that we're blind. We don't need to pray for anything. We kind of have that forest through the trees uh, view. I can see the trees. I'm good to go. And that's a, a, we become focused on the wrong things. And worse about this is, that, is when we begin to deceive ourselves into believing that we do see everything. And so we're going to look at this story this morning beginning in John chapter 9, verse 6. And I want you to read with me those first three verses. Having said this, this was Jesus, and you can go back later and read what he said. He spit on the ground and he made some mud with the saliva. And he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, and wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. And so the man, man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed he was. Others said, No, he only looks like you. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Now, I want us to keep in mind that the healing of someone born blind is something totally unheard of in those, in those days. In fact, in verse 32, we'll see, has anyone ever heard of someone being born, uh, healed who was born blind? This was such a shocking thing that some of the people there couldn't even believe their own eyes. Th their view was, you know, that's impossible to do. And so here when this guy shows up, and he looks just like the guy that used to sit and beg, and he talks just like the guy that used to sit and beg, but he can see now. Well, that can't be. Because in my mind, in their mind, it was so said, you can't heal a man born blind that they have to come up with some other rationale for this phenomenon that they're seeing. And so what they say is, well, that must not be him. It must just be his twin that's shown up out of nowhere. It's somebody that just looks like you. Now this in itself is a form of blindness, and many of us have, have experienced this. When God works in the world in such a way that doesn't fit our understanding of how God works in the world, we start looking for other excuses and other reasons and other explanations for it. For instance, there are those of us who read in the Bible where it says, and God created the world in seven days or in six days, and then he rested on the seventh, and he spoke it all into existence. And then there are those on the other side who said, that doesn't fit with my understanding of the world and God and everything else, and so now they've got to come up with other reasons and other explanations, such as this big explosion where nothing exploded into everything and created goo from which cells got together and made humans. There we go, that works. It's almost the same as saying that it's not the same guy, it's just a guy that looks like him. And it's a spiritual blindness that won't allow someone to really see the awesome story that's going on around them. And then we pick up again in verse 10. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. You know, I mean, this is such an amazing thing, okay? So if you are the one born blind, then how did it happen? How were your eyes opened? In verse 11, he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to, the, to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Now, I want us to notice in this in this story as we go through here, I want us to pay attention to the blind man's understanding of Jesus. Here when they ask him, who did this to you? He, his answer is, the man they call Jesus. He's not a prophet. 
He's not a king. He's not Messiah. He's not Lord. He's just the man they call Jesus. And it would be easy for us to read that and say, well, John, you know, just put, well, he said it was the man called Jesus. But I think John had a specific reason. I think the story developed this way because the guy at the beginning, that's all he knows of Jesus. He's a man named Jesus. Now, his eyes have been opened, and he knows that. But what we're going to see through this story is this blind man whose eyes are, have been opened, his understanding of Jesus develops and grows because his eyes are open. The story is about the contrast from that man with the religious leaders who claim that their eyes are open, but they have already closed them and they don't develop in their understanding of Jesus. They stay in the same place they've always been because they're focused on the wrong thing. Now keep that in mind. That's the whole theory and the theme of this whole big story as we're going to go through. The Pharisees' understanding, they don't, it doesn't grow, it doesn't change because they are already set in who they in what they understand. And so picking up in verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been uh, born blind. Now, here's where we know there's going to be problems. The day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. And therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Notice there, they're making a statement, not a question, a statement. He's not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But there were others who asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? And so they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the man blind, to the man, to the blind man. What have you to say about him? What, what, it was your eyes he opened, and the man replied, he is a prophet. Now notice, he's no longer just the man they call Jesus. But in their discussion of him, is he a sinner? Is he not a sinner? This, young, this blind man starts to think, he's got to be more than just a man. And so he comes to understand he is a prophet. Now the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're not making these steps in growth because their minds are already set. Their focus is not on the healing. Their focus is really not on the man blind. Their focus really isn't even on the man they call Jesus. Their focus is on the Sabbath. He broke one of our rules. One of our religious traditions and their understanding of a religious tradition, I guess you would say. God had established laws regarding the Sabbath. They were to keep it holy. They were to remember that that was the day on which God rested. God intended the Sabbath to be a day for man to reflect on the fact that God provides. And I don't have to worry. I don't have to work on this one day of the week because God rested on that day of the week. I rest on that day of the week. God's going to take care of everything. But they had turned it into something totally different. They had a religious tradition that you can't do this, 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 this on the Sabbath. And Jesus made mud on the Sabbath. Violated their law. And so their mind was set. And they didn't see, they were so focused on that that they did not see the whole story and the awesome thing that was going on. And we know that because verse 18, uh, picking up the story, the Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? His parents answered, well, we know he was our son. They answered. And we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him because he is of age. He will speak for himself. Now, I think this is interesting. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ 
would be put out of the synagogue. And that's why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Here's another form of blindness. The parents are so afraid of not fitting in with what they've always fit in that they won't even allow themselves to see who Jesus really is or acknowledge who Jesus really is. And so, a second time, verse 24, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And again, here we see how far, how set they were in their ways. Why is it that they know without a doubt that Jesus is a sinner? Because he made mud on the Sabbath. Righteous people don't make mud on the Sabbath. Righteous people don't open the eyes of blind people on the Sabbath. We know that this man is a sinner. We don't know that a blind man receives sight, but we know that this Jesus is a sinner. The blind man replies in verse 25, whether he was a sinner or not, I do not know, but one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. And then they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Now, I love the response of this guy. He's getting a little sarcastic here. He says, he answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now here, this guy, not only, okay, he started out, he's a man named Jesus. And then he's a prophet. Now he's a prophet worth following, worth having disciples, maybe even worth the religious leaders following. But the religious leaders will never open their eyes because they think they've already got this figured out. And so, verse 28, then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Now, I want to stop right there and go back to last week. Jesus puts mud on the man's eyes and sends him to the pool named Siloam, which means sent. And I showed you last week how, you know, over in chapter 6, Jesus says, when they said, what, is, what do we have to do to do the works of my Father, of the Father? And Jesus said, to do the works of God is to believe in the one He sent. The problem the Pharisees had is they never could accept the fact that Jesus was the one sent from God. We know God spoke to Moses, but this guy, we don't even know where he came from. And they would not allow their eyes to be opened to see where he came from because they were holding so firmly to their religious tradition and religious practice of the Sabbath that they couldn't see the awesome story and acknowledge the truth about where Jesus came from. Verse 30, the man answered, now this is remarkable. I love it. I mean, you guys are the religious leaders. You're supposed to understand all this stuff. And this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. I mean, after all, that's what you guys have always told us, is that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. What is the blind man saying about where Jesus comes from? He comes from God. The blind guy saw that. The Pharisees, their eyes were so shut because they thought they were already open that they missed it. And to this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And so they threw him out. The Pharisees, they were convinced. They already said, We know Jesus is a sinner. And now we know that you're a sinner too. Why? Because you were born blind. You were steeped in sin at birth. Both of you guys are sinners. We're righteous. You're out. We're in. Verse 32 or 35. 
Jesus heard that they throw, had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. When Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man here, it, it ought to be understood that it was equivalent with the Messiah. Do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Uh, who is he, sir, that I may... Uh, the man asked, Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe and you worship him. This is a progress. This is what we see in the man whose eyes were now open. Jesus begins as just the man they call Jesus. And then he's a prophet. And then he's a prophet worth following. Then he was sent from God. See, all of this and all this conversation, the blind man is beginning to put all this together that, that this guy must be. And now he makes this, the statement, Lord. And, and it would be easy to say, well, that term Lord in Greek could mean just master or you know a very polite term. But then it says that he worshipped him. This man who at one time was blind is worshiping the one sent from God. The one who can give abundant life. And this is contrasted then with the Pharisees. And, and so uh, in verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see, or I guess a better way to understand, those who think they already see, will become blind. And some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your sinfulness remains. If you were blind, and realized it and admitted the fact that you didn't already have all the answers and, and sought to see who Jesus really was, then your eyes would be open and you would come to know the truth. But since you think you've already got it figured out and you know all of the answers, you're going to be blind. And there will be no hope for you. Now, we read this story and it's awesome to see what happens to this blind guy, but we've always got to take this over and say, well, okay, well, what about it fits my life? And, and, if, if, you are, if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and maybe you haven't really known who He was or anything, I hope this lesson speaks to you that we need to come to Him. We need to say, God, Lord, open my eyes so that I can truly see who Jesus is. Not just as a man who can do miracles, but I want to come to know Him as Lord and Savior. But most of us in this room, at one point or another, we came to Jesus. We were buried with Him in baptism and we've been living the Christian life for a long time. And so what is the message in here that we need to understand for ourselves? Now, we, we never like, we don't like to look at ourselves and question whether or not we're like the Pharisees. Because after all, the Pharisees in these stories are always the bad guy. If they had hats on, they'd be black. Actually, they were, weren't they? Probably were black hats that they were. They were black hats today, but that doesn't mean that all Jews today are bad. And I got myself off on that. But anyway, we would be we would be the cowboys in the white hats, and they would be the bad guys in the black hats. That's the way we like to look at ourselves. But I want us to think about the way we view things, because a lot of this has to do with the way we look at things. And and let's be honest, most of the time we we think we have this view that if we attend church often regular, then we're good folks. We're righteous people. And those who don't attend church regularly, well, they're questionable. We look at things like if since we attend the right church, the right brand, we're good and righteous people. Those that don't, they're questionable. We give regularly to the church. I mean, you ought to look at my checkbook and see how much I've given. I give every single week because that's what I'm supposed to do. And those that don't, they're questionable. 
If we do the right order of worship, the right way on the right day, everything else, then look at me. We're good. We're righteous. And those that don't do the right order of worship on the right day of each week or, or even on the first day of each week or anything like that, well, they're of questionable character. We don't smoke, drink, or cuss. So therefore, we're good, righteous people. And we don't associate with those who do because those people are a little bit on the questionable side. <clears throat> if we study our Bibles regularly, and we can quote passages, we've memorized passages of Scripture, then boy, we are good and we're righteous people. And those that don't really know their Bible, you know, like Lance is having to teach a class on Wednesday nights to teach people the books of the New Testament or the Old Testament because we don't have them memorized. And people that don't have them memorized are a questionable character. I told you guys a story tonight about when I first started going to church and I sat down in a pew and a lady came up and told me that that was her seat. And she was not joking. And I had the little tabs that I had put on my Bible where all the different books were so I could turn to them faster because I didn't have the Bible memorized. And she told me, she said, you should take those off. You should just know where the books of the Bible are. We laugh about that, but we're all guilty of that stuff in some way. There's a little Pharisee in us all, whether we like to admit it or not. It's a self-righteousness judgmental attitude where we've closed our eyes because we know that we've got it all figured out. We know that we are doing it all right. And church, what this passage is telling us is when we start knowing that we're all right and we've got it all down right, we make ourselves blind. And we need to have open eyes. It says, you know what? I, and, and, I, and I have to be careful here because I know some, some people will say, but you know, Lance, the way that we worship and the way we do all of these things, it is right. And, and I'm not denying that, but we do all understand that it's not those religious practices that, that give us salvation, that give us eternal life. Amen? And, and not only that, but you know, this series is on abundant life. You will never gain abundant life by doing all of the right religious practices. Amen? I know some of you are going, I'm not sure about that. If I amen you, the guy next to me is going to really be on me. But, but we're never saved by our religious practices. The only way we are saved and the only way we have abundant life is coming to know Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to see in this story. Next week, that's when Jesus starts to do the whole thing. I am the good shepherd, and that's when he makes a statement. I have come that they might have life and have it abundant. And the whole story from the beginning of the blind man until that, where Jesus makes that statement is coming to realize that we're blind and we need Jesus to open our eyes so we can see who Jesus is. Because that's the only way we're ever going to really know abundant life. And so this call to, to, that I made earlier to those of you that have never come to Jesus, that have never been buried with Him in baptism, have never acknowledged Him as Lord and Savior, you know, that call really goes out to all of us. Because just like this man born blind, we begin with one understanding of who Jesus is. But as life goes on, we talked about this was in our class this morning. We were talking about the fact that I wish I knew then what I know now. And Mark Toomey came up and he said, he said but, but it's what we learned during that process that makes us know what we know now. And I said, yeah, but imagine starting that much further ahead. The, the, I cannot, over and over again, I, I say this, I understand more about who Jesus is now than I did 20 years ago. And that makes me, under, makes me realize that there's still so much about Jesus that I don't know. But back 20 years ago, when I started in ministry, I thought Jesus was the most awesome thing ever. And He is. Today, 20 years later, I realize that I know do so little about it. He is so much more than I even knew back then. If it was awesome back then, it's like quadruple awesome now. And I just can't wait to understand even more fully. But the only way we're going to get there, church, is if we realize that we're blind 
And we ask you. You know, and this is you go through all the passages of scripture where Paul Paul even says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened, that you may know him better. And that's that's when we're going to get abundant life, church. When we really know who Jesus is. It's not about going through religious practices. It's about knowing who Jesus is. Let's pray. Father, we do want our eyes open. We realize more and more how, how blind we are. And all of the things that we have looked for in this world to bring fullness and abundance of life, they don't really work. And we see that now, we understand that more and more, and that's why we cry out, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see Him. I want to know Your Son, Jesus Christ. I want to know the power of His resurrection so that I may enjoy that abundance that comes through that. Father, open the eyes of my heart. And all of the church prayed this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're here this morning and, and you need help seeing Jesus, or maybe you've seen Him and you want to give your life to Him, whatever we can do to help you enter into this abundant, amazing life God has for us. If you want to come down to the front and, and share that with us, ask questions, anything we can do to help you experience abundant life, please come while we stand and sing.